Greetings from beautiful Reiner, Virginia. I wanted to share this video with you of my backyard. The foliage is spectacular during this time of the year. In fact, it's at its peak for the season right now. When you read the news on the internet or listen to it on the television, do you ever find yourself scratching your head and saying to yourself, this doesn't make sense. I don't know why it doesn't make sense, but I just, just doesn't make sense. Well, you're not the first generation to have that problem. You can go all the way back to the church at Corinth in the New Testament and find a lot of confused people. The Apostle Paul helps us in our dilemma. Stay tuned. Session 6 in our study of 1 Corinthians. I'm glad you're with us. Before we begin our lesson time tonight, I want to make two announcements. First, you probably noticed that Session 4 of our study in this book has not been posted. Well, actually, I did try to post it three times, but for some reason YouTube would not take it. It would never get through the processing. So, what I plan to do is to re-record it and then try to post it again. I'll try to have it posted early next week. The second announcement has to do with subscribers. I need to increase the number of subscribers to my channel. That will allow me to reach a larger audience with these studies. If you haven't subscribed yet, would you consider doing so? It will help a great deal. Thank you so much. All right, let's turn now to our lesson for this evening. In our last session, we did not finish our examination of verse 17 of chapter 1. So I want to begin tonight by finishing up with that verse, and then we'll move on to verse 18. But before we begin, let's pray together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this wonderful time of the year and for this wonderful time to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for this great letter from the Apostle Paul. We know that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and therefore it is worthy of our study. Help us tonight to understand what Paul is saying, what you are saying through Paul in this portion of this letter. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let me read verse 17 of this first chapter for you. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. We ended our last session with a discussion of the theology of Christian baptism. We saw that, without diminishing the importance of baptism, we cannot say that baptism is necessary for salvation. Dr. Gordon Fee says in his a great commentary on 1 Corinthians, he says this, It also seems clear from this passage that Paul does not understand baptism to affect salvation. He goes on to say, For Paul, baptism comes after the hearing of the gospel, but it does so as the God-ordained mode of faith's response to the gospel. Now then, Paul goes on to say that Christ sent him primarily to preach the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ may not be emptied of its power. Now this part of verse 17 introduces a long discussion by Paul on two issues, the cross of Christ and the problem of wisdom. In fact, this discussion takes us all the way to chapter 2, verse 16. And as you can see from the wording of this part of verse 17, Paul sees his own proclamation of the gospel in contrast to the wisdom preaching 
one might hear throughout the city of Corinth. And that kind of preaching seems to have infiltrated the church at Corinth. So let's go back to our study of Acts for a moment. You remember that Paul briefly visited Athens. And his time in Athens was not particularly fruitful. Athens had, and has by the way, a tremendous heritage in being the home of some of the greatest philosophers of all time. Socrates, Plato, Athenagoras, and Aristides to name a few. But those philosophers were long gone, and by the time of the New Testament church, philosophy had become more of a game or a means of entertainment than intellectual pursuit. You remember that after Paul gave his first speech in Athens, most of the people rejected his message. A few did accept it, and the rest said, come back later and we'll try this again. In other words, we want you to entertain us a little more with your new ideas of a crucified God. In his second letter to Timothy, Paul summarized the problem like this. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. Itching ears. We want to hear more of your good ideas but we don't want those good ideas to influence our lives. Now the city of Athens was only about 65 miles from Corinth, and so the philosophical tradition of Athens spilled over into Corinth, as well as other nearby cities, in fact, to the whole nation of Greece. And like the city of Athens, the philosophers of Corinth lacked depth. Paul is not saying here that the philosophers are too high for him and they would drag Christianity into some intellectual quagmire. They would drag it into a quagmire, but it would be a quagmire of ignorance, not intelligence. Paul would not be derailed by any foolish arguments that would rob his preaching of its power. The power of the gospel came upon those who heard it as Paul proclaimed it, not as he didn't proclaim it. Christianity for Paul was not a faith to be debated. It was far too simple for that. Simple enough for any person to believe and be saved. Christianity was a faith to be declared. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans. And that was his goal. And Christianity was a faith to be received and obeyed. Apparently, the philosophical tradition had infiltrated the church at Corinth, and it's possible that some of the debate over Peter, Paul, and Apollos, if not others, came in the form of useless philosophical debates. Now, let's be careful here. The Bible does not tell us that all wisdom is bad, by no means. There is human wisdom, and there is divine or godly wisdom. The Old Testament book of Proverbs is filled with exhortations for us to pursue wisdom. But as you read those verses, you get the impression that the wisdom the writer is writing about is not some intellectual ivory tower, lofty understanding of whatever. This wisdom is not an attempt to be intellectually superior to others. No, the wisdom of the book of Proverbs is what we might call street wisdom. Wisdom that gets us through life. And in the New Testament letter of James, he tells us, If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. Now this is also street wisdom, but it adds a spiritual dimension that shows us how to live in Christ in a fallen world. Neither this kind of wisdom nor the kind of wisdom spoken of in the book of Proverbs were the issue in the Corinthian church. These believers there were debating something else. What? We don't know. But it had to do with a gospel message where the cross was central. All right, now let's turn to the cross and its message. What is the message of the cross? The message of the cross is that through the unjust death of a peasant preacher named Jesus, God reconciled the world to himself. Now, a man's death on a cross was, in the thinking of most people in that day, the lowest point a person could fall in the Roman Empire. 
But in that lowest point, Jesus reached his highest point. And that is the great mystery of the cross. Those who saw him hanging on that cross deemed him cursed by God. And what was deemed the place of absolute defeat, Jesus won his greatest victory. The mockers said he saved others, let him save himself. They didn't know that if he did save himself, then he wouldn't have been able to save others. Through the loss of his life, his dignity, he raised us up to our most noble position and gave us life as we had never known it before. Suppose we took a living thing, say a, a plant, and we buried it in the ground alive. Eventually, of course, it would die. Wouldn't the death of that plant or animal mean utter defeat for that object? Wouldn't we just walk away from it and dismiss it as of no value whatsoever because it was dead? But what if the object we put in the ground was a living seed? That seed would eventually split open and die. But from that splitting open and dying, we would bring a new plant to the surface. And if the new plant grew to maturity, it would yield fruit that would bring hundreds of, or perhaps thousands of new seeds. And its fruit would feed an animal, even a human animal, giving it life. What was thought to be death turned out to be life. The very idea that one could bury and kill a living object to bring forth life is, at face value, foolishness. But to those who know the wisdom of God, it is life. Didn't Jesus say, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain? But if it dies, it bears much fruit? Why did Jesus tell that story? To whom was Jesus referring when he spoke those words? Well, he was referring to himself. Now I want to refer to my message uh, from this past Sunday in the two churches I served. My message last Sunday was about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is one of the most important themes of the Bible. It certainly was one of the most important themes of Jesus' teaching. And one of the most important things we can say about the kingdom of God is that it is a contrarian kingdom. Now, what does that mean? When I was a teenager, I would sometimes get into arguments with my mother. And she, in her frustration, would ask me, why are you so contrary? What she meant was that if I had a choice to side with her or side against her, I would more often than not side against her. If she said up, I would say down. If she said left, I would say right. And so we would argue. Now it occurs to me that I misspoke when I said the kingdom of God is a contrarian kingdom. It's not the kingdom of God that is contrarian. It's the kingdom of this world that is contrarian. It opposes the kingdom of God. Now Paul says here that the preaching of the cross is contrary to the thinking of this world. That's what he means when he says it is foolishness. The word for foolishness is the Greek word moriah, from which we get the word moron. For many people, only a moron, an imbecile, would believe the message of the cross. The world says that dead people are not victorious, especially dead people who have died by execution. And in that day, especially execution on a cross, the worst way you could die. Such people are defeated fools. If you really want to be victorious, you take up your weapons and you fight and you strategize enough to outmaneuver your enemy and kill him. That's victory. Of course, you'd better make sure you know exactly who your enemy is. Those who believe that Jesus' death was foolish do so because they don't know who Jesus' enemy was. They think it was the Roman army and the Jewish officials, but it wasn't. It wasn't those soldiers who drove the nails in his hands and feet and the sword into his side. Defeating them was a cinch. Didn't he tell his disciples that at any time he could have called down legions of angels for his protection? Had he done that, he would have perhaps won the battle, but he would have lost the war. Who, or what, were Jesus' enemies when he went to the cross? 
His enemies were sin, Satan, the world, and the flesh, what we call the fallen human nature. If you look at Jesus' strategy for defeating those foes, then you realize it was a perfect strategy. Paul wrote, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why is it foolishness? Because those who are perishing are always fighting the wrong battle. If you don't know what the battle is, if you don't know what enemy you're fighting, then you'll never win the victory. You'll perish. Gordon Fee calls the preaching of the cross the great divine contradiction to our merely human ways of doing things. And he was right. When you look at what is happening in the world today through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of the kingdom of God, then you understand what is happening. It all makes sense. You may never see anyone lift up a Bible and say, this is what I oppose. I hate this book and, and its message about God. Very likely you won't hear anyone say that. The enemy knows it's not wise to be so bold. Nevertheless, when you see what the world is saying loud and clear today, you realize that what is being said is a total rebellion against God and his word. Let me illustrate. The most basic fundamental doctrine of the Judeo-Christian faith is the doctrine of creation. It all begins there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Behind that statement, there are certain implications. One of them being that God oversees that which he made. He is Lord of his creation. But then the evolutionist comes along and says, God's not in charge of creation. He didn't create it, and therefore he has no right to it or lordship over it. No, creation is a matter of chance. Therefore, God has no say in our moral life. We can do exactly as we wish. Every person can decide for himself or herself what is right and wrong. Now that's called moral relativism, and that is rebellion against the absolute moral standards that God has commanded us to observe. If you debate the issue of evolution today, it doesn't matter if you bring a truckload of evidence to combat it. Many evolutionists will always come down on the side of evolution. Why? Because they don't want to submit to the God of creation. That's the problem. So even though the consequences of rebellion against God's moral absolutes are significant and tragic, humanity continues to shake its fist in God's face and declare that it will not submit to his lordship and obey his commands. Now go a little further down the page in Genesis and you will see that God created us, humans, with two genders, male and female. But despite all the millennia of humans living within the confines of those two genders, we are now proud, and I put proud in quotations, to announce that we have discovered that we no longer need to live in the confines of those two genders. There are in fact many genders, and we can choose our own gender. I heard a commentator say recently that we have now discovered over 50 genders and others have said that the number of genders is actually endless. And we can decide what gender we want to be. That is a direct assault on what God has created us to be, male and female. It's a direct assault on marriage. Not only is it an assault on marriage, it is an assault on the family unit. Now, I've already told you about the extraordinary uh, extraordinarily high number of babies who are born out of wedlock in the black community. That number is as high as 69 percent. And I recently heard uh, of a number that was even higher than that in, in the 70s. And the number of babies born out of wedlock outside of the black community is growing to the point where it is close to the number of the black community. In other words, millions of babies are being born with no father figure for those children. And the consequences are tragic. Another assault on the family unit comes in, in premarital sex. Search where you want, but you will have difficulty today finding a couple that has not had premarital sex 
and, or, and a child out of wedlock. Fornication and adultery are rampant in our society. No segment of our society has been untouched by this sadness, including politicians and even clergy. That is an assault on God's guidelines for sexuality. We rebel against them. So all of this is rebellion against God and his kingdom. The world is a contrarian kingdom. Let me theorize that all the problems we face as a society today relate to some attitude of rebellion against God and his kingdom. Let me give you one more. You shall not commit murder is the fifth commandment. But we have decided to legalize the slaughter of preborn babies. Isn't that not the shaking of our fists in the face of God and saying, we will not follow your moral code? This is the world's wisdom, and we are proud of it, even though it is destroying us. Now Paul goes on to say, and I quote, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God." Unquote. Notice the present tense of the phrase, being saved. Salvation can be said to be a past event, a present continuous event, and a future event. We are saved, or we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It's a process. Paul wants his readers to take an inward look for a moment and ask themselves, how did you come to the hope you have in Christ Jesus? Did you come to this hope because you engaged in discussions and debates over the philosophy of redemption? Did you earn your salvation through grand knowledge? Are you now a philosopher able to argue the finer points of wisdom? Or did you come to your present hope because you heard the simple message of Christ crucified and raised from the dead as the supreme demonstration of God's love for you. Do you see the problem here? The Galatians were drifting away from the gospel because they were believing that if they obeyed the law of Moses, then they would earn their salvation. But these Corinthians might have boasted that they would not fall into such a trap. But they, were they were falling into another trap, the trap of false intellectualism believing that their great learning made them special and deserving of God's favor. They thought they no longer needed the foolishness of the cross. They could do better than that. They could move on from Paul to reach higher spiritual heights. No, says Paul. If you abandon the cross, then you abandon Christ and you abandon hope. Note verse 19. It begins with the word for, and that word links what Paul is going to say with what he has already said. It goes like this. The reason I told you that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to those who are being saved, is because God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the, of the discerning. I will thwart. Now, I don't misunderstand what God is saying here. God isn't saying, I don't like when people live independent, independent of me and they can reason out their own lives. I don't like it when they are successfully successful independent of me. God's not saying that. What he is saying is that he is going to show the futility of human intellect and human reason when it is done independent of him. And I have always already shown that in looking at modern day moral reasoning in our culture, every time we boast that we have discovered a way to live successfully independent of God, we ultimately show failure, emptiness, hopelessness, despair. Now let me drop in another example of this faulty reasoning. Have you noticed that no one looks at the problems we face today and say, we've got a moral problem in our nation? They never use the word moral. It's not about morality. Almost 50 years ago, psychiatrist Carl Menninger wrote a book titled, Whatever Happened to Sin? If the question was appropriate in that day, how much more is it appropriate today? But you will seldom, if ever, hear that word mentioned in the national discussion. It's no longer in our vocabulary. Why? Because we don't think our problems are moral. 
We think they're economic or political or something else. All right. We're going to take up here next time. Let's pray as we close. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you as we close this lesson to ask you to help us to think through the lens of the kingdom of God, through the lens of the word of God. Help us to think clearly. Help us not to fall in the traps that we tend to fall into when we become independent of you. Help us, Lord, not to, uh, to not fall into the trap of a false intellectualism that steers us away from you, steers us into pride, into a false sense of salvation. Lord, thank you for our time together as we study this great book. Continue, Lord, to help us as we make our way through it. We pray this, Father, humbly before you. In Christ's name, amen. Paul loved the Corinthian believers. As we will see, as we continue in our study, Paul's heart was broken over the direction this church was taking. He truly had a pastor's heart. See you next week.